Hi, I'm Marty Levinson, and I'm very good with scissors. Hi there, I'm Marty Levinson. Welcome to the Northtown News Magazine with the greatest cameraman around, Sonny Hirsch, and your host, Javi Myers. Thank you, Marty. Hi there, welcome to the Northtown Neighborhood News Magazine, a presentation of Sonny Hirsch and myself. Dial us up on the web at ntnm.org, where over 70,000 shows have been watched. Thank you very much. Uh, Caps24.org, great place to go to find out about community policing. At this point, we'll have a new commander in the 24th District, and we hope it's, um, well, we know who we want, don't we, Sonny? But uh, let's see if we get them or not. And um, community policing has been a major problem. We're not going to talk about it yet with, with the cuts and all the rest of it. We're not going to discuss specifics until after we know who the new commander is and we'll see how the, how the system shakes down. But the fact is that the uh, B-team sergeant concept, even though we have a terrific sergeant in the 24th District handling it, is a flawed concept in the first place, and it is an impossible job. It, it is a job that cannot be fulfilled successfully. And from what I understand, too, that all the cuts in the community policing office result basically in one4 more policemen being on the street, that's um, absurd compared to the damage it's doing to community policing. And the 298 crossing guards that they're, they're cutting, um, which is 12 per police district, will result in active police officers being on the street. It might save a few dollars, but it's not going to make for a better police department. So um, as we say in Hebrew, we need a fool, which mean, means a real, real get well. Um, <laughs> Uh, we also want to uh, express our condolences as well, my guest will, on the uh, passing of Judge Sandra Otaka, um, who was a guest on the show and, and was a terrific lady and the very first Asian judge um, to be elected. And, um, you know, we, we send proper condolences to her family. In the meantime, it is my pleasure and privilege to have our commissioner of the 13th District, um, who at this point is finishing up his second term. I guess he'll tell us, too, if he's running for a third term. Uh, it's Larry Sefford. How are you? Hi, Abby. <laughs> Thanks for having me. First of all, my pleasure. And, and uh, I just would like to extend my condolences to Judge Otaka's family. She was really an exceptional person who represented our area and lived here in Rogers Park. And uh, her 16-year-old son was very dear to her and uh, was often with her when she did things. And I think motivated her as, as she served in the juvenile courts in the Child Protection Division where she was out there trying to protect and enrich the lives of so many children that are in our society needed help. So it's a great loss that uh, she's died and uh, you know I, to her, her son and the rest of her family uh, my condolences. Now, So let's talk about let's move on to uh, civic matters at this point. Um, a lot been going on with the county. We haven't had you on in a few months because you've been busy with the budget and all the rest of it. Well, you know, the, the county, is, as you'll remember, when I started, I used to come on your show and say county is stealth government. Right. Today, it's no longer stealth government. We, we fight uh, with uh, the, the city and the, and the state to get on the front page of our newspapers and to get on our, our 10 o'clock television news. Uh, most of it, unfortunately, is still not positive, but there are some, some positive things. Uh, one... Um, I think we are on the verge of, of convincing Todd Stroger, who now has vetoed two proposals that I voted for, one to repeal the 1% of the sales tax and one to repeal three quarters percent of the sales tax, to agree to a repeal of half a percent so that the county tax would go down 50% uh, of what it is uh, currently. And that would be a significant boost, I think, for retail throughout Cook County. Um, we are a stable government when we, when we imposed the tax, and when I voted for it, I came on your show and said I did it to stabilize the government and to get an independent health board. That independent health board has had over a $200 million cash turnaround uh, in running our hospitals and our health clinics. And we are at a point right now where we, we do not need the money generated by this uh, half a point. Actually, I don't think from the whole point, so we could have reduced it uh, to its original rate of 0.75%. But... Uh, hopefully, by the time this airs, President Stroger will have agreed to this. Uh, as you know, we have a very weird law. It requires in Illinois. Four, in, in, yeah, <laughs> it requires 14 of the 17 commissioners to override a veto. And yeah. I, when we passed the repeal of the one percent, we had 10 votes, and we could only muster the same 10. When we uh, repealed the three-quarter point, we had 10 votes, and we could only uh, muster the same. 
10 votes. And so we were unable to override uh, the president's veto. But uh, we believe we've negotiated with him so that he'll agree to this. We, we'll find out if he does it, the burden will be on him. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I think he's turned the Stroger name from a name that his father spent a lifetime building and uh, therefore having the hospital named after him because of that lifetime of good works into the standard name for what represents bad government. And I know he was on your show recently. I mean, he's still not engaged. I wish he were more engaged as, as a leader, but uh, he seems not to be. So that's where we are on the sales tax. On, on health care, as I've said, the new independent board is doing a, a very good job. Um, up here in Rogers Park are three federally qualified health clinics. The one that is Access on Howard Street, the one that is Heartland Alliance on Tui, and, and the one that is uh, uh, the Asian Human Service uh, component, uh, which is over at uh, uh, Trilogy. Uh, those, those three clinics are doing very, very well. Well, that's good. That I'm glad to hear. Yeah. And of course, it was uh, you were one of the main people that fought um, to get these things over here. Because that was a glaring need that we had in this neighborhood. Right, and it still is. You know, I met this week with St. Francis Hospital, and they have their clinic still on Clark Street. And, and you know, we have to work to, to strengthen uh, primary care for our people. And, and in this economy, as more people lose their jobs, or even if they don't lose their jobs, they're losing their benefits and they're losing their health care because companies can't afford it. So uh, as we go into the month of July, President Obama has said he would like to have a national health care plan passed by the end of August when they go uh, finish uh, their work in August. And I would hope that the Congress and all of us should be pulling to work with him to make sure there is a public health component to cover everybody who does not have insurance. There is still a component to augment what employers do. And there is an, a, another component that allows people to choose their own insurers if they want. I think all of those things are in what President Obama wants to do. He has been phenomenal in delivering for, on his promises with the Congress, so I'm optimistic that what didn't happen in 1994 with the Clintons will happen uh, this year with Barack Obama before Labor Day. That would be, uh, I'll tell you, that would be nice. The health care is the one thing, I always call it, that's the one socialist thing I'm really in favor of, but I really am in favor of it. Well, and it is the one thing that causes more people to go into bankruptcy. You know, the cost of health care continues to spiral out of control. Uh, and, uh, you know, we cannot have people who are just having their basic needs and their basic health protected put into a, a worrying situation that now this is going to bankrupt them. You know, we need to let our seniors and our, uh, our people with young children understand that if they have a challenge through some health issue, that there is a, an alternative to help them get through it. And, and I think President Obama will do that. At the county, we are right now serving in our health system one million patients. That is 18% of the population of this county. I mean, that wow. is, uh, it, to me, it's remarkable, and it continues to grow again because of the economy and people losing their health care. And people with serious illnesses, I'm happy that the county hospital is there and that we can get people into Stroger Hospital. But we, we need to come up with better solutions, and so I'm I promised myself that I'll spend July and August working with the president's team to encourage either here or in other states members of Congress to vote for the proposal he'll be putting out. And yeah, that's that to be big stuff. And of course, uh, I always have to give you credit when it comes to health care. You've always tried to do the right thing. Yeah. Now, you know, the other thing that happens, health care is, is one of those things that everybody worries about. But they also worry about their housing. Okay. And, and uh we are going to be, as the first township in the city of Chicago, Rogers Park, uh, reassessed. And the reassessment notices should be mailed by the end of the month. And people will have 35 days to appeal to the assessor's office. So I want to, as you know, I've done seminars <coughs> uh, whenever we've been reassessed. A number of them. I remember I saw Pete Kowalski for the first time in a long time right. do one of your seminars. Uh, we will be having a seminar on July 15th at 6.30 at night at Warren Park for everybody who lives in Rogers Park. We'll be advertising this. We'll have plenty of staff from the assessor's office there. Hopefully these assessments will be much lower than they were previously. The assessor has promised to take into account the economic reality of, of, of uh, the downturn in sales in the, in the area. And, but everybody should challenge their assessment to get the lowest possible assessment so that you only pay your fair share. 
Yeah, that would be, a, and you've been very good about uh, helping champion people along that cause, and um, I certainly hope people will take advantage of the seminar. I have been, I have been to one of the seminars, and actually I also, when, when I did appeal my taxes, which I w actually went to your office in Evanston, right. and the people there, and I, I don't remember their names offhand, it's been about four years at this point, um, they were very, very um, friendly. I mean, there's, there's certain, I mean, legally they have to, to, to walk a line being county people, but... Uh, we're here to be advocates for our constituents, and so I, I have they two, helped educate two staff me what lawyers. I needed, right, they educated me what I needed to do. Yeah, I had two staff lawyers and other people, and we're, we're there to help you get the right assessment for your property. So uh, I hope that uh, when you get the notice, don't let it scare you. Realize that you have rights and come to our seminar July 15th at Warren Park and you know, we'll, we'll deal with that. The, the other thing I want to just talk about since uh, I'm here is, as this beautiful weather uh, comes back and it looks like summer will stay this time and okay. we're gonna have, um, is the forest preserves. You know, we are so blessed with having these beautiful forest preserves just a little bit to the west of, of Rogers Park. And I want to encourage people to go out there and walk, to go out there and ride their bike, to have a picnic. If you canoe, get a, uh, there, get a canoe and go out on the north branch of the Chicago River and, and really enjoy nature and get away from the stresses of daily life. Our forest preserves are just a wonderful, wonderful option that fortunately people in, in 1914 determined that we should do, they should do for the rest of us and they've done it. The Botanic Garden, which is the, at the end of uh, our Forest Preserve uh, bike trail up on Lake Cook Road, is probably the most beautiful spot in all of Cook County. It's gorgeous. And, you know, the, the staff up there are just so outgoing and so reasonable. There's so many volunteers. I encourage you to go up there. It is free if you can uh, ride a bike or walk in there. If you drive a car, you have to pay a, a parking fee, but the park itself is, uh, the garden itself is open and I'd encourage you to do that. And if you are riding a bike, we have now for the first time uh, adjacent to the forest preserves, and the, and the forest preserves did a lot of work to make this possible, the new Holocaust uh, Museum and Educational Center. Um, when you're there, you'll see that the parking lot for the, the, the Holocaust Museum right off of Gulf Road is on forest preserve property, and that's intended to encourage more people to use the forest preserve. Actually, it's right next to what is marked now as Calvin R. Sutker Grove, my predecessor oh, in office. Okay. I was able to name what was an old polo field for, for Commissioner Sutker, and that area will uh, ultimately, hopefully, become a, a, an active area for families and picnics and uh, things. But to get into the Holocaust Museum, one of the great privileges of my office was working with the Holocaust Museum staff for the opening, because uh, the land that it's built on was county land, which we, I was able to put an ordinance through to sell to Skokie for a dollar, and Very therefore nice. the museum is now on land that's in the village of Skokie, which makes it a public museum, which mm -hmm. helps it get additional uh, support from the state. But the, the opening had some of the most remarkable people there. Uh, General Colin Powell uh, came for the, the, the gala to start the opening festivities, and he talked about how he, as a young boy, worked for a Jewish merchant in the, in the Bronx where he grew up. And that, he talked about all the lessons that that man taught him and the responsibility he gave this young boy. And, and uh, he joked that as time went on, uh, that man had died, but his, his children, who are now in their 80s, were very proud that uh, uh, Kali, as he was called, uh, <laughs> no. um, had become the Secretary of State <laughs> and, and that they felt they were responsible for training him. And so he was there. And Ellie Wiesel... I, I mean, here is a man, we, many of you, we saw him last week uh, when the president was uh, in Germany. Right, at Buchenwald. At Buchenwald, where Mr. Wiesel's father died. I mean, he was one of the most moving speakers, just in general, as everybody who's heard him knows. But, you know, just to talk about the genocides that have gone on since World War II and why a museum like this is necessary was, was remarkable. And then former President Bill Clinton, who... Um, Actually, compared to Mr. Wazell, was, was probably the secondary speaker on that day, and I don't think he's ever used to that that happening. But he was there and talked about how he he, he knows that there, he made mistakes, that he could have done more in Rwanda, he could have done more in Yugoslavia, and and you know just to hear 
him say that at, no matter what level you're at, you can continue to learn and the importance of having this museum there. So I, I hope if you go to the Forest Preserves, you'll go to the Botanic Garden and go to the Holocaust Museum. I think both of those will be trips that will make your summer and, 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 and you'll sit there and say, thank God I live in Cook County. Sounds great. And uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I was very sorry I wasn't able to attend the, the Holocaust Museum things. The timing just, I, I went out of town and the timing didn't work. I was invited to both of them in my role as publisher of Jewish Chicago. And it's not like me to pass up free dinners, let alone meeting people like Colin Powell and Bill Clinton. Well, I, I will just tell you a little story. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, the dinner and the grand opening were in a tent. Mm. And the Holocaust Museum came to me and said, I, we need a permit from the Forest Preserve to put a tent up. I said, no problem. I called the Forest Preserve and I said, work with them on getting a permit. Now, I never asked how big the tent was. The tent was longer <laughs> than the uh, football field at Soldier Field, than, than a, a, a National Football League field. Wow. More so than 100 yards long. It, it was 45 yards wide. They put a second tent up that was about half that size to run next to it so that you could accommodate with under tent over 12,000 people. Uh, wow. And it, it was one of the most remarkable things. And the first time I, I went in and, and I looked at it and I said, I told them to get a permit for a tent. I didn't expect this to be like this. This was a steel superstructure. It was, it was absolutely uh, remarkable. But the night that uh, Colin Powell spoke, we had a huge windstorm come up. And you're still in a tent. And I had been told that the tent had been rated to take 75 mile an hour winds, but a policeman told me as I came in that the, the winds were gusting at 57 miles wow. an hour. Wow. So as That's I watch close. Colin Powell, <laughs> I'm, I'm watching the top of the tent and it's starting to move. But above Colin Powell, there was a, uh, a long metal piece that had all the lights on it that were shining down on him. It started swaying. There were these huge TV screens all throughout the tent and they had uh, projectors that were set, you know, maybe 25 or 30 feet away from them that were all hanging from the tent, they all started swaying together. So I'm looking at this, this thing over Colin Paul's head is swaying, the screens are swaying, the projectors are swaying, and I'm sitting there saying, Colin Paul, please finish your, your remarks now, because the <laughs> one thing I do not want to have is the former Secretary of State get hit with a light at the opening of the Holocaust Museum. Wow. Unfortunately, we all got out of there. But, you know, it, the, you know, those are the kind of things you get involved in as a county commissioner, worrying about getting permits for tents. Yes, Memphis, you know, it's interesting because the Jewish Folk Art, with all the Jewish legislators we have around here, the Jewish Folk Art Festival, uh, Michael, uh, for, uh, Michael, Michael Lorch, Lorch told me, who, you're, the go to, you're the go-to guy for everything he needs for the Jewish Folk well, Art Festival. Uh, right, and you know, Michael's now a new trustee in the village of Skokie. Oh, that I didn't know. Yeah, he was elected on April 7th, a remarkable man who has been one of the leaders of the Jewish Folk Art Festival, and that's every other year at St. Paul Woods, uh, so it won't be this year because it was last year. Right. And... Uh, but that is one of the most remarkable things. There, there's something that brings almost 40,000 people in two days into the forest preserves. Well, one day. Because one day is building and the other day right, is doing. That's right. Saturday. <laughs> right. So, so if you ever get a chance to go to that, please do it. And again, yeah, he, he and I have worked on hydrology to make sure that the water drains so that we can, we can let people walk in. We've yeah. worked on parking issues. Um, you know, the, the beauty of the forest preserve is we realize that we're dealing with renewable land. And as long as we treat the land well... We, we, we can do things. I, I Probably the best work days, I do a lot of these work days where people come out and we cut down buckthorn, the invasive plant that is killing a lot of our native species of plants in the forest preserve. And I do it with groups. Sometimes it's business groups, but the absolute best groups I've done it with have been um, uh, from synagogues and they've been the youth groups where the rabbis have prepared the children on, on how precious land is and how our responsibility to improve the quality of the land. And and, and these children, you know, many of them are in high school, they're, they're young adults, they're, they go in and are so serious in protecting our land. And, and that's really one, another part of the, the good parts of, of the county. Actually, at the last uh, Folk Arts Festival, I was interviewing some of the, they actually had an ecological friendly thing that the Jewish Federation was doing, where the kids were talking about um, the environment and resources, almost like it was religion itself. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, we are just so lucky, and I, again, encourage you, go into the forest preserves this summer. Even if it's just to take a walk, you know, just get out away from the city lights, get to a place where you may see a deer running by, or you may see a fish jumping out of the, the north branch of the Chicago River, 
something that's out of the ordinary, but it'll, it'll relax you and you'll sit there and say, thank God I live here. Yeah, it's nice. But by the way, that's the North Branch of the Chicago River as opposed to the North Branch of the North Shore Channel. I, I did not say the North Shore <laughs> Channel. You know, you know, the, the channel has its own <laughs> unique challenges. And when I see the folks with boats down there and I look at the uh, color of the water, and I know Terry O'Brien does everything he can mm -hmm. to make that water uh, uh, useful, but there is something about a, a teal green that is unnatural. It is. A, well, you know, what, what people don't realize, and, you know, it's a very nice thing to think, hey, we ought to be able to swim here and all the rest of it. That is a mad main channel, and the whole thing, there's no little shore you wade down from. That whole thing is, is super deep. I mean, it's a danger. As a matter of fact, well, what will have been on the air the week before you is we rerunning the show. We, we'll go to the, our, our website, ntnm.org, and take a ride aboard PC1 with us and Terry O'Brien, and you'll get to see what's really down there. It's really pretty cool. You, you wouldn't believe the things that are down there. Yes. And, you know, they have 68 varieties right now of uh, fish that are actually there, not that you want to eat them. And we actually had footage of somebody catching a five-pound gefilte. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, 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 it. <laughs> you got it. Okay. I got it. I got it. Uh, um, you know, one of the other things when we have flooding, yeah. uh, Terry O'Brien and I have to talk to each other periodically because the towns I represent yeah. uh, often need the locks at Wilmette open. Uh, and, oh. and, and, you know, that is one of the major flood control projects. One of the more interesting things is in the towns I represent that are north of Wilmette, like Kenilworth, they're, they're complaining they're flooding and they open the locks, open the locks. Well, the interesting thing is when you're north of Wilmette, yeah. the, the water flows into your sewer system and brings it south and then into the uh, uh, channel. So when we open it up, it really doesn't help them immediately because we still have to get all their water to the south to get it back to flow north and into the channel. So, you know, there are a lot of things you learn about the way that the, the, this whole area was uh, put together and sewers were put in and different engineering uh, uh, theories that they had to, to protect people. Um, but I, I find, you know, and this is going back to just knowing the land, in Kenilworth we had major flooding problems when I first became the commissioner. I went up there and realized that there was a, a channel, an east and a west diversion channel that were put in by the uh, President Roosevelt's uh, WPA, Conservation Corps, in 1936. Oh, so it was Franklin, and, not Teddy. <laughs> Franklin. And, and it was intended, to, as, as a diversion ditch, yeah. to divert water into these ditches until it would hold it until it could then, uh, uh, instead of flooding. Well, they had silted over. And so I found and got some money to clean them out. And since then, there's been no flooding in most of Canada. Wow, Canada. that's uh, great. Uh, so, you know, and that's just a simple, natural technique to create a, a, a ditch. You know. But it works. It works. Yeah. yeah. Natural things do tend to work. Um, are you going to run for re-election? I, I expect to. Um, I expect that uh, Commissioner Claypool will be running for president of the county board, as he did four years ago. And, and as you remember, I was supportive of him then, and I look forward to supporting, uh, supporting him. And uh, hopefully the people of uh, my district in Rogers Park and in Evanston and Skokie and uh, New Trier Township and Northfield Township uh, and Lincolnwood will give me another term. I think there's still a lot of issues to be done to make the county a more responsive government. I agree with that. And um, hey, early and often, I'll be voting for you. But thank you. Abby. That's for sure. It. Now, we have a new commissioner uh, right next door to us we, now. We do. Mike Quigley uh, was fortunate enough to win a 13-person primary and is now not the newest member of Congress. There's actually been three members of Congress since he got elected, so yeah. he's moving up in seniority rather quickly. Uh, and he was replaced on the county board by Commissioner Bridget Gaynor. And Bridget Gaynor is a remarkable young woman who had worked for the Chicago Park District. She was in charge of all their lakefront activities, I think from uh, uh, Rogers Park through the uh, south side. She uh, uh, then went to work for, in, in City Hall and was in the budget department uh, of the city and really understands municipal finance. And for the last number of years has been the, the director of government affairs for Aon, the large insurance company. Um, she was appointed by the committeeman, has been now on the board about two months, and she is just a breath of fresh air. She has got a lot of great ideas. Uh, and uh, I, I really look forward to working with her, and I hope you can get her on because, as you know, she represents the south end of Rogers Park, 
a little bit of the 49th Ward and a little bit of the 50th Ward. Right, she's basically from a little north of Devon in certain places. I mean, it's it's a funny line, but... Uh. <laughs> right, I go up pretty much to Arthur, and, and so she she is south of Arthur. Right. Uh, and uh, along the lakefront, she has the Loyola campus. She goes from Pratt uh, down along the lakefront. So uh, I, I think that people will enjoy meeting her. Uh, uh, I think that she is reaching out. I know she's talking Monday coming up at the 49th Ward regular meeting that they have... Uh, with Alderman Joe Moore, and she's been in, in the 48th Ward, and she's been, you know, in the 46th Ward, in the 47th Ward, in, in the uh, uh, 43rd Ward, you know, all the places that that district kind of winds around. Uh, and it comes up uh, into the 50th, as I said, a little bit of uh, Pat O'Connor's Ward uh, and, uh, and some of the 39th Ward, a little west of us. Yeah, I think I'll probably invite her to the next shoot. And for those of you who, we, by the way, we're also going to be inviting some people from Sonny and I took a, a, a seminar from the police department recently, and some of the top brass that uh, we, we spoke with will be invited. So we're going to get more into the police thing. With the changing commanders, we haven't had much of a chance to do that, but we will be getting into it more. Um, Springfield, you're down in Springfield quite a bit. What did you think about what went on? Well, you know, I, in Springfield, because of the Bogoyevich mess, remember this session started off with impeaching a governor and then convicting a governor. Two things that are not ordinary. and No, so, but a very righteous cause. <laughs> a, a very righteous cause. But it, it made the agenda, the need to do reforms, the need to do a budget, the need to do capital, and then the need to do the regular work. And a lot of that regular work hadn't been done for the last four or five years because of, of Bogoyevich. And, you know, as they finished at the end of May, they, they, they were unable to finish a budget. They did seem to put together a capital plan. They, they have a number of reform uh, uh, issues that have passed, but I think the Tribune puts eight issues out there, and three of them are still incomplete. Um, and so I, I, I think that that's going to fester for a while because the people don't have the confidence in the government they need, and, and Bogoyevich has destroyed it. Having his wife eat tarantulas <laughs> doesn't exactly uh, add to anybody having any confidence that he knew what he was doing. In fact, he... Whatever modicum of, of respect he had is totally destroyed now by his actions since his arrest and, and I, indictment. I can say to people from day one, I told you so. And by the way, I just thought, I thought what, uh, what uh, Pieti Bogoyevich did was uh, fitting and appropriate for the family. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I, they have two little girls, and I, I feel terrible. Uh, that's for, a for, different for, story. For, that is, yeah, yeah. that is sad. I'm sorry, go ahead. But, but you know, I think that we, 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 we need to have them finish the ethics, and we've got to get a budget, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, Governor Quinn, I think, is a good man who is working very hard to reestablish uh, this state as a, a legitimate uh, uh, ethical place to live and one you can be proud of. But it's going to take a while, and I think that the General Assembly was not able to finish their, the work. I don't know if they can do it in the short term or if he's going to have to accept the partial budget they gave him, and we come back after the, you know, January or February to try to resolve these issues. Um, uh, it, it, it's going to be um, uh, difficult uh, for him to do it without additional revenue. And I know it's difficult to vote for t tax increases. Here I started the show telling you about how I want to repeal half of the tax that, that I voted for because I think we can do that. We're in a much better position than the state. He needs to figure out uh, how he can get additional revenue because they, they have really left him a $12 billion hole, and I think he's got it whittled down but so he's about $7 billion dollars yeah. Uh, is what he needs to do. But, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing. So 45 second warning. <laughs> okay. Well, I, you know, I, I, I look forward to working with our members of the General Assembly because so many of the medical and health issues they're dealing with directly impact on the county. And I just want to, in, in these closing minutes, thank you for the opportunity to come and periodically report to my constituents here the things that are going on. And I, again, if you have any questions, our office is in, in Evanston. It's right on Davis Street, 820 Davis. I share it with Congresswoman Schakowsky, Senator Schoenberg, and Representative Hamos. The phone number is 847-864-1209. We are there to serve you in any way for any county issue, either your assessment, your voting uh, information, if you don't know where, where your polling place is, anything that uh, relates to the county, we're there for you. I, Karen Chavers and Mike Gwynn and Hollis Hanover and Alicia O'Neill of my staff uh, are... Uh, there to serve you. And the, the funny thing is, Alicia O'Neill is, is um, um, my Jewish member of my staff, but, uh, but she has the Irish name. Very good, and I want to thank you very much, Larry Suffern. Thank you, Sonny, and bye-bye, everybody.